a joke. So I just flew in from Portland, and boy, are my arms tired. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I've been waiting to say that since I got here. Um, all right, so let's load up our slides. Not that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Play. Yeah. Woohoo. Good. Everyone got their pizza? Okay. Thank you for coming. Um, is this too loud? No? Okay. Uh, my name is Joe Grand, and yeah, like Sophie said, uh, I design products. I don't know really about the nicest guy part, but I design electronics, and I also break electronics. So sometimes I do computer security types of stuff, um, hardware hacking training, that sort of thing, and then I design electronics, sometimes for computer security related things, and sometimes just for fun. This talk is sort of a combination of both. Uh, it kind of started off as a little investigation into what you could do kind of from a security perspective of exfiltrating data or leaking information from devices through ways other than like wireless or network or app or whatever um, through LEDs because lights are available on so many different devices. And I thought that was really cool. Um, but it sort of morphed into more of just a, a general purpose kind of open source module for receiving light waves and potentially doing things with them. Uh, so it's just kind of this combination of things. I've always been involved in electronics and just loved electronics. Uh, so when I see something that excites me, it's like I'm gonna build something out of it and then hopefully like do something cool with it and hopefully other people do something cool with it. So that's what this talk is about. So yeah, LEDs are everywhere and we generally just think of them as devices that blink or turn on and show something. Uh, you know, like if you've ever seen war games with the Whopper, the more blinking lights you have on something, the more secure people think it is. Uh, so I thought it would be fun to like do something with those. Um, there's been a lot of research into this area from a computer security perspective of um, capturing emissions from light and using them in some way or misusing them in some way or say if there's like some malicious piece of code running on a device that's then exfiltrating data. So what I have done and what I've experimented with is not new, but it just got me really excited that I wanted to dig deeper into it. Um, the first paper that came out about this publicly anyway that I know of was from 2002, this information leakage from optical emanations that is basically about off the shelf devices that have not been modified at all. Um, and back then think about like modems, um, I think there are some routers and other network type of equipment that would actually leak information through the LEDs completely unintentionally, not by design or anything, just by accident. Um, sort of just the way, the nature of how the person, the engineer designed the product. So with a modem, for example, is um, the you know transmit and receive lights that blink when there's some data activity going on. Those were actually tied directly to the transmit and receive lines so that the LED was actually modulating with the data that was being sent which is pretty awesome. Um, and those are just off the shelf devices. That sort of sparked my mind of like, well, if you, if you could get you know, malicious access to a device, or maybe you wanna just do something with a, on a hobbyist project of have something you can use an LED to modulate, and you can use it also as your status LED or whatever. So you can sort of serve double purpose. Cause you'll see with the demos that I'm gonna show you, I'm able to, to send light uh, and the LED is gonna appear like it's just on because our eyes you know, can't process that, that, the, the data rate. But then with the optics by receiver, which is the actual product, um, you can receive the data as well. So it's sort of, sort of cool. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of other work as well, but I'm, I'm all about the, the kind of the, the school of like, you know, everything we do, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, right? We're doing something and we're taking these little incremental steps. No matter how groundbreaking something is, there's always some prior art that had been done or somebody else doing something maybe that wasn't successful and you take bits and pieces and build on it. But that's really where my whole kind of passion for electronics ha has, ha that's how it started and that's how it continues, is always building on things. So stuff's really cool. Um, oh, I should mention too, I forgot to mention this. Uh, I wanna say hi to my kids because they're staying up late to watch this. So hello, Ben and Miles, thank you for staying up late. I'll be home soon tonight. I gotta fly back, so I gotta work on my, work on my arm muscles a little bit, um, flying back tonight. So anyway, thanks for watching. Uh, yeah, so prior history. Um, all the way back to around 1880, Graham Bell with his photo phone, um, there was a, uh, a video, oh man, oh Dino, I can't remember his, I can't remember his full name, he's gonna kill me, Dino Segovis, I think, um, runs uh, a website, Hack-A-Week, I don't know if he still makes videos anymore, 
Uh, but he had a video about recreating the photo phone, and it was basically what Graham Bell had made of transmitting voice over light waves in 1880. And he actually had said that he thought that invention was, was I don't actually have the words because I can't see my slides, my notes, uh, so I don't have the exact quote, but it was something like that was a more important invention to him than the telephone. But it just never really took off because if you had cloud cover or other things, it was using reflect the, the, the sun to modulate sound over the sun, um, over the light of the sun being you know, reflected off a mirror. Uh, so it didn't always work in certain weather conditions, but he thought that was more important. So yeah, Dino's video actually shows that and it's really cool. So it's like, you know, that was analog voice and we're doing it with digital, but 150 years ago and like it's still, I don't know, it's still pretty cool. Um, fiber optics, of course, what we're doing is just like a poor man's fiber optic, uh, except just without the optic, without the fiber still with the optic, without the fiber. So, you know, you have your transmitter and it's modulating data in crazy mathematical ways, and then it's receiving it on the other end. We're doing the same thing. We're just modulating data and then we're capturing it uh, just over the air, through the air. Um, and there are lots of other optical network systems that have, that have, be, that have started being developed, um, VLC and Li-Fi, there's a whole bunch of other ones. And uh, sort of one of the ideas I had with this device as this optical receiver is like we might be able to identify those types of networks in a building or in an environment where we might not be able to decode it, like our receiver probably isn't fast enough or capable enough to decode it, but we might be able to identify things within a room, which I think is sort of cool. Especially if you, if you know that there's not supposed to be something like that in your, in your office and you find something, it could be interesting. So yeah, lots of work. And this is really just another step in, you know, experimenting with optical stuff. So my goals for this, like most of my products out there, um, are open source. And the, the real intent is like, if I get excited about something, I'm gonna build it. And I'm only gonna build stuff that I get excited about. And then hopefully other people get excited about it. But if not, I'm still gonna use it. Uh, but being open source is of course very important because then people can build on it, learn from it, build on it. Um, you know, I spent most of my youth building stuff out of magazines and it was, you know, it was before technically open source, but that's how you learn. So yeah, open source device, I wanted to, to be kind of an easy to understand theory. So I didn't want to have a lot of complex signal processing and all sorts of stuff. As you'll see, it's just a very simple system of receiver uh, with some amplification and a comparator. So it's a very easy thing kind of from a block diagram perspective to kind of understand. Uh, I wanted to use off-the-shelf components so you can get everything from DigiKey or Mouser or whatever your favorite um, distributor is. You could use, uh, you could use fine chips to maximize your bomb and find the correct distributor. <laughs> How, is that a good plug? Good, okay, got, I got a thumbs up, good. <laughs> um, and then hand solderable, right? Because there's nothing worse than finding a project and then realizing there's like chip scale packaging you have to put on. So it's not the smallest device and that's intentional. So you can actually do something with it and build it and then modify it if you need to. Um, but yeah, again, this is not groundbreaking, but it's to raise awareness and just give people another tool to experiment with. So here's the device. I'll go into a little bit of detail and then I'll give some demos um, and uh, answer questions. But this is what it looks like. Basically, it's an optical receiver. It will turn light into voltage. Um, the photodiode I'm using is a pretty beefy one, and I'll get into details of all of it, but it has a, a, a pretty wide wavelength, so it imitates the, the spectrum of the human eye, as opposed to most photodiodes are, are most sensitive in the IR range, infrared range, or near infrared range. Um, this handles visible light, because doing stuff with a light that you can't see is cool, and I'll show you a demo of that, but doing it with a light you can see, like I said, because you don't see the blinking, like I think that's even awesomer, if that's a word, more awesome. Um, because you can see it, so you just, your brain is sort of like, oh, okay, well, it must not be doing anything because I don't see it blinking, but it's actually doing something. So it has a really wide range, so it could do visible light, and that's, that's really a key thing. Um, signal speeds, we can go down to 100 hertz. If you want it to go slow, up to one and a half megahertz, which is pretty fast. Most of the demos I'll show you are gonna be transmitting data at like 9600 baud or 19.2 kilobits a second, something like that. Um, so it doesn't even have to be that fast to trick your brain. Uh, let's see, some other stuff, the gain and threshold adjustment, I'll, t I'll talk about those in more detail. And um, for this particular version of the device, the one that looks like this, has a uh, mini USB connector on the back. So you can power the device through that and receive data through that as well. I always like showing early versions of uh, 
of, of the process. Um, this, this whole project, I should mention, um, so you know, when I talked about I was experimenting with s stuff from like the computer security side of things, I'd actually built a digital receiver over here that's much simpler that uses a uh, fiber optic receiver. So just like a normal fiber optic system or like, um, I think it's like SPDIF or TOSLINK or something that ha uses a red um, LED or, or a diode of some sort to transmit data and then you plug in your little fiber optic cable to there. So it was just a, a digital receiver that took in NRZ encoded data, non-return to zero encoded data like asynchronous serial, which we'll talk about. Um, so a very simple thing and I was using this in a class that students would build the kit and then discover the secret message being transmitted on a light for this project that, that we were working on. So it started as just a very kind of innocent thing. Um, and then over time it morphed into like, well, we could do digital, but that's a little limited because you don't really have a lot of control over, over kind of uh, fine tuning for different types of targets. So let's try, you know, making it a little bit better. So I use an analog receiver and then I had to figure out more of the analog side of things, which for me, I'm a digital guy. I do embedded system stuff. Um, analog electronics is not really my strong suit. So what better way to learn than do it? Uh, so. I built the analog version, which was based on an application note from Maxim that I, that I linked to later on. Uh, and then from there, a friend of mine said, the, the, everything's hard, kind of hard coded in here for particular gain settings and threshold, which wasn't as useful. And a friend of mine said, after I did all this, he's like, why don't you put potentiometers on it so you can fine tune stuff? So that's sort of the progression um, of this one. Now you can fine tune things, a different receiver, and uh, then eventually went to the final version that you'll see. I like doing um, breadboard style stuff at the beginning so you can kind of plug things in and if something doesn't work you just take it out put it back in so I always start with you know the, the plug board breadboard style so here's the block diagram very simple um, we have our photodiode front end two two stages of amplification which you'll see uh, and then a threshold detector which basically just converts decides what level something should be a logic level one and what should be a logic level zero and then the serial to USB adapter, and then the USB connection, and then little power supply circuit. So very, very simple, um, but, but effective, right? You don't need to over-design stuff. That's another, another good takeaway, at least for the stuff I like to do. If it has a specific function, you don't need to add extra stuff to it. So I didn't, you know, didn't have internet connectivity, no Bluetooth, no you know, iPhone app, or whatever. Like, it just does what it needs to do. And that, that I think, is, is uh, very important in, in my, my point of view, anyway. So here's what the board looks like, that the final one, all of those other kind of intermediate boards are also available on my website. Um, there's links at the end, it's grandideastudio.com slash something, you'll see. Uh, but those are all there too, so if you wanted a bigger board that's easier, you can mess around with those. Um, so yeah, this one, so photodiode, the, the board sort of follows the block diagram. So photodiode receiver over here, the, the, uh, the amplifiers here, the threshold comparator here. There's a little switch so you can invert the polarity. If you're receiving a signal, maybe that's inverted. You can just flip the switch. You don't have to mess around with extra circuitry. And then that feeds into an FT231X uh, USB to serial adapter and then out to the computer. That's what the schematic looks like. I'm not gonna go through all of it, uh, but I'll go into little pieces of, of each one. So. Again, the front end, the photodiode, this is a, uh, a Vichet BPW21R uh, that takes light and converts it to current, like any photodiode. The reason I like this one, again, it has the, the, the spectral sensitivity mimicking the human eye. It's not exactly the human eye, it's actually more sensitive than the human eye, which is cool, on the sides, but it kind of mimics it more. Um, this is set up in a photoconductive mode where basically when light shines onto it, current flows through it, and then there's a voltage that's created uh, thanks to Ohm's law, and then we just take that and we can amplify it. So actually our first stage of gain adjustment of our sensitivity is done right at the beginning on one potentiometer. And there's three different ways that you can, that you can adjust the gains and the sensitivity. And you'll see, since we're in a bright room, we're already receiving data, and I'm not, I'm not pointing at anything because there's just light. There's the big lights, there's the sunlight, and there's the fluorescent light. So everything is kind of bouncing around. So if you kind of fiddled around with the potentiometers, you could reduce that sensitivity. Um, I just didn't. <laughs> um, so the next stage coming in from that photodiode, we have a, a tiny little voltage coming in, and then we have two stages of ampli amplification. 
Um, by doing it with two, these are both exactly the same, almost exactly the same configuration, um, with some dealing with some offset voltages and stuff in the middle. But by having two separate amplifiers instead of one amplifier with giant gain, if you have two amplifiers with not as giant gain on both, that reduces the amount of noise that you're eventually putting through the system. So that was the intent, if you have two of those. And then there's the total gain, transimpedance gain, which is the current to voltage gain coming from the photodiode is this little tiny equation. That's your three, your three different stages, your, your load resistor, your bias resistor gain, and then your two gain stages of the amplifier. So you can actually get, I think by default of mid-range, when, when, when the uh, products are built, the potentiometers are at mid-range. And if I remember right, just at that mid-range default gain is like 26.7 million or something, which is pretty big. Um, so you can turn those down and you can turn them up. You'll just get more noise as you do that. But there's actually some benefits. It's really neat with photodiodes um, where the sensitivity is inversely proportional to the, uh, sensitivity is inversely proportional to the, I can't even remember what it is. It's cool. Uh, <laughs> to the, I think it's to the speed. If I remember right. So if you need higher speed, you can reduce the sensitivity. If you need more sensitivity, you effectively are reducing the, the, the speed, the, the bandwidth that it can deal with. Something like that. Um, so then next stage after that, I'll show you kind of oscilloscope screenshots of what these pieces actually look like visually. Um, but once we amplify our signal twice, then we throw it through the comparator. That's going to determine what is a level one versus what's a level zero. And we do that by just adjusting a potentiometer that's a voltage, a voltage divider, resistor divider, and then we just set that threshold. Um, so the normal situation when these things come out of the box, you don't really have to do any fidgeting with stuff. It will generally just work. But to have all the stuff in here, if you end up with some device that you're experimenting with, maybe that you know, ha ha has a different output or different brightness or something, you might need to tweak that a little bit. And then the final stage uh, is the USB to serial adapter. This powers the device. And then it will take in the output from the comparator and then dump that out to the computer. So because this is a USB to serial adapter, it's going to show up on a computer when you plug it in as a virtual COM port, virtual serial port. So you could use a terminal program like PuTTY or HyperTerminal or Screen or whatever your favorite terminal program is to receive the data that's being received from OpticSpy. Now there's going to be situations, all of our demos, I'm transmitting UART data, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, so that's going to be received by the USB to serial adapter because that's the type of data it's expecting and then send it to the computer. But if you're working with the system or say you're just exploring the world looking for something, it's probably not going to be in asynchronous data. Uh, so we won't receive that on the computer, but there's a test point that actually isn't shown here. Uh, I think it's TP5, so you can just tap on before it gets to there and then hook that up to like an Arduino or Logic Analyzer or whatever um, to deal with it. And you can still just power it through the USB port. So that's the reception side. For transmitting, um, there's lots of ways to do it, but I just want to do the simplest possible method. And after being inspired from that paper from 2002, where they just had their data lines connected directly to LEDs, I was like, what if I just have a device with an LED, and just like I would normally control it with a GPIO pin to turn it on and off, I'll just use that GPIO pin as my, my data output, and then just modulate the LED. So that's the hardware for, some, for my demos, is basically that, just a standard LED configuration. And then I'm using uh, UART asynchronous serial communication, so a standard type of serial port, and I'll show you the code, what that looks like. Uh, um, also very simple, this of course is on my oscilloscope just demonstrating the, uh, the encoding. And this is called a non-return to zero NRZ encoding. So if you capture a blob of data, to me it looks like asynchronous data anyway, NRZ encoded, because th it, basically the widths of everything are kind of multiples of the smallest, which is a good indication that it's going to be NRZ. Uh, so like now that we know that's the smallest width, we could actually manually go through and say, oh, zero, zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero, one, and recreate all of that. Though that could sometimes get a little time intensive. Uh, so you could you know, decode it with your logic analyzer, oscilloscope, or you let, you know, let your terminal program do it. And uh, here's the code for 
two of the examples. Um, some of the demos I'll show you, the code looks a little bit different. All the code's up for the demos on my website as well. Um, but just to show you how simple it is, you don't need a lot of stuff going on. Like this top one, um, this actually was from some code I used on a PIC, but it's basically setting up the serial port and then just using printf. And instead of printf going to a console, it's printf going to the I.O. pin that's driving the LED. Down here, Arduino, so setting up a software serial port, just pointing the pin to the LED. And then you just send a message. So, you know, pretty easy if you want to implement that into your own kind of project. And then just here are the, the screenshots. This is like, there's a few different test points along the way on the board that you can see each stage. So this is test point one. Um, right after we're capturing, but before it goes into the first stage amplifier, it's very noisy and you basically can't see anything because the signal's in the noise somewhere. Second stage, we can start to see ones and zeros. I don't remember what I was transmitting. Um, and your screenshots might vary depending on the signal, but generally you'll see something like this. Where you can see the ones and zeros, there's kind of noise all over the signal, and of course it's offset by a lot. That's that first stage. So the second stage, there is a resistor and capacitor in there that, that, gets, rid of the, the, um, that gets rid of the offset and, and some other stuff uh, before it goes to the amplifier, the second stage amplifier. Once it goes through the second stage, it's starting to look more like a real signal. And this is the point where you say, okay, now we need to, to figure out what our threshold voltage is gonna be. Where are we gonna set our comparator? We can see there's like some droopiness at some of the, at some of the signals. Um, that's due to the distance away from the, sort of the, the signal strength of the LED. But it also is, depending on the speed of the signal, the slower the signal, the more droop you'll have, which is due to the, the RC in between those two amplifiers. Um, so in this case, like we'd probably set our threshold voltage around here, which would be, uh, I don't know. Can anyone see? 1.6 or something. One, two volts. Okay, two volts. So we set it at two volts, and that should be good. Once we do that, then we can start to see on TP5, the output of the comparator looks like real digital data. And I have my oscilloscope decoding stuff down at the bottom, so there's part of the message, and then the second part. So that's sort of what we try to go through, starting from a signal that we can't see much to an actual signal that means something. Does that make sense? Okay, demos. I also can't see how much time I have left, so I don't know how over I'm, I am. Uh, okay, so first demo I'm gonna show you is using a Parallax electronic badge. This is like a little hackable badge that Parallax made. Um, and they're a great company that does hobbyist robotics and electronics and and things, and, and uh, they've made these as like a hackable badge for conferences and stuff, sort of a general purpose generic one. Um, it has an infrared LED on it, so no, no visual indication, but it's still sending data, and of course, because it's infrared, we can't see it, but other devices possibly could, like our photodiode. Um, I actually used this during production to, to test the badges, because it was an easy way I could write some code for it, and it actually displays the message that I'm transmitting through the infrared LED, and then I can capture it and verify, or someone else can verify that it's, that it's working. So I'll do a demo. Actually, I'm going to call up Alvaro, who's back here. Alvaro and I also met uh, around the time where Sophie and I met, and uh, he does a lot of cool stuff. He's going to hold the microphone while I'm doing some demos. <laughs> he makes a really good mic stand. Um, all right, so I'm going to exit out of here, and uh, I have my little terminal program running already. You can see there's like a lot of data already because it's so light in here, and if I cover it, then there's no, no data, which makes sense, or no, no noise anyway. So I'm not going to bother tweaking the settings. I don't want to mess anything up, but I'm going to turn on the badge, which will say Optic Spy Demo Sending, and it's sending a secret message. And assuming I have the baud rate set up, I can just kind of hold this. It is going to be noisy because I don't have enough hands to sort of cover everything, but secret message. secret message, you can sort of see it. And like, I need more hands because I have to cover the here. See if you, yeah, nice. <laughs> I'll see if I can, I'll see if I can block the light. It's so bright in here. Yeah, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so that, that one was like, I was probably an inch away. In a, in a slightly darker environment, you could get a few inches for sure um, with infrared. Infrared, because the photodiodes are so sensitive still to infrared, you can actually get pretty far. Um, let's see, okay, so that was the first one. Don't go anywhere, Alvaro. Um, next one is something uh, with, with something called Tomu. 
And Tomo is a device, uh, another open source hardware device that looks like this. It's a tiny little microcontroller on a little circuit that sticks into your USB port. And uh, you can write a bunch of code. There's a great development environment for it. You can write code. It has capacitive buttons or capacitive sensors, two LEDs, and a whole bunch of other really cool stuff, 12 components total. And uh, I figured, OK, well, it's a cool little microcontroller. Like, we can control the LED through a computer. Let's use that. So this is the demo, which you're, you're probably not going to see it because it's shoved into the USB port. But this is what it looks like. And um, what I'm going to do is, with Tomo, we actually wrote some code that will serve as like a little menuing system. So we can type in a message and then go to the other window and receive it. All right, here we go. You're really good at this. Here, hold it higher, like this. OK. <laughs> you should have just been here the whole time. Um, OK, so let's see. Um, hello, HDGG. So type in our message. And down here, I don't know, maybe you guys in the front row can see it. Now the red LED is on on Tomu. Looks solid. Looks solid red, right? So yep, can't tell it's doing anything. Definitely not blinking. Um, I should bring you to all my talks, too. This is awesome. Uh, so I have to change the baud rate to 19.2 because that's what it is. So now, again, there's still noise. Um, so here. Ooh. <laughs> and this one, I'm also a few inches away. <laughs> Thank you. And then I can, you can turn it off, and now it's just noise again. What's that? Oh, yeah, and then I have that one, too. Um, yeah, maybe if you, like, shake your head really fast, you'll see the blinking, depending. If you do it at, like, 1,200 or 2,400 baud, you'll actually be able to see it. <laughs> um, okay, this one is, this one I have a video of, because I didn't bring the actual thing here. Um, but this is one kind of from the security mindset of, like, all right, you have this router, or say you have a computer that's not connected to the internet, how would somebody bad, some malicious person, get data off of that computer? And we hear, we've heard a lot of stories of like Stuxnet and other things like sneaker net of somebody walking a compromised USB thumb drive to like the nuclear reactor computer and plugging it in and all these things um, because a lot of computers are going to be air gapped. So this was sort of an idea of like what if there was some malicious code loaded onto the device in advance, maybe during manufacturing or intercepted uh, before it got to the facility or whatever, and then how could somebody get data out? So I took an off-the-shelf TP-Link router um, that had already been hacked to death uh, software-wise, and um, people have loaded DDWRT onto it, which is like an open source um, access point software, lots of stuff you can do, Linux-based. And one of the features of DDWRT is that you can control the LEDs, because you can control all the I.O. pins. Uh, so I figured out which I.O. pin controlled the LED that I was interested in, which was the WAN light, which normally is going to be on anyway. Um, but it was also red, which I thought would have the best sensitivity for the, for the receiver. And then wrote some code, just like the other demos, to send information out. Um, of course, this is a proof of concept one. Security people out there are going to say, well, he needed physical access to load the code onto, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's out of my pay grade. Other people can figure out how to maliciously load the code onto the devices. There's plenty of them out there. So this video um, will show, instead of sending a secret message, what I'm doing, since I have administrator access on the device, is I'm reading the password file, which holds all of the, the password hashes. Uh, corresponding to the passwords on the system and sending that over the LED. Once I have that, I could then crack the password using standard password cracking techniques and then log into the device remotely or whatever it is. Um, of course, once you have administrator access, you can exfiltrate whatever data you want from it. So here's the, here's the video. So now it's like the program I wrote is executing on this device. See. So not blinking. This one actually blinks a little bit at a time because with Linux, there's all sorts of software overhead. So I had to do some kind of interesting delays to try to get the data to uh, transmit properly. There's my earlier version. And this I have to hold it pretty close because there's, there's the LED, then there's a light pipe, and then there's the housing on top. So it loses a lot of the optical energy. Uh, but it's still enough where if I hold still, so this is executing on the router. This is what I'm capturing with Optic Spy. And then eventually it will dump the whole thing. It's hard to stay still when I was doing this. But I finally got it. And uh, yeah, so then have the whole password hash. 
I just like that concept too of like, oh, thanks. <laughs> I like that concept of using already existing products to do stuff because that really like kind of messes with your head. And then this is a special one for Sophie, uh, made by request, where when we were emailing about this, she's like, so can you come and give us a talk? Uh, what are you working on? I'm like, oh, Optic Spy, it's just like this silly little receiver thing. Um, you know, I was never expecting to, to give, really to give talks on it or anything. Um, she's like, oh, I think I saw somebody at Maker Faire that was doing some like, data transmission with lasers. Can you use a laser and then use Optic Spy to receive the stuff so we could like transmit stuff across the office? And I said, I don't actually know if it will work with a laser. Probably because a laser is a color and we can detect it. Um, but I didn't know if it would be like too much laser for the, for the diode or something. Um, so I built a little demo that I'm going to leave, uh, leave here and uh, leave at the supply frame office. So this was sort of an attempt of like, could you do long range? Because the receiver of the diode, you know, it, usually it's just a few inches. It's not a huge amount. Um, so this, you're basically just limited by the amount of diffusion you get from the laser and, of course, the output power of the laser. So if you have a, a, lo a, long, a, a powerful enough laser with good enough optics, you can, you know, send stuff really far, just like a point-to-point, -point, you know, laser system that would exist otherwise. Um, what I did in this case is I had a, a product that I designed for Parallax that, that's a laser rangefinder. That's a whole other story, um, but it, it was basically using triangulation of a, of a laser spot to determine the distance of the, of the rangefinder module to the item, to the product. So it's just a, like a really cool way to do rangefinding, very slow, but a cool way. So I had one side of it was a laser diode. So I already had this driver, and I didn't want to spend a huge amount of time on it, so I took one of my prototypes and just chopped the laser diode controller portion off. Uh, and then had to do some little bodge wires to make a little module where now I have power ground and this is what the system looks like. It's power ground and I have a laser diode that has the onboard um, automatic power control APC um, and the driver and everything. So you just apply power to it and it will go. And what I did for the laser rangefinder is I had, this requires three volts. Um, so I had a low dropout linear regulator in the front that I would just power it through whatever the system voltage was, which in this case is five volts. Uh, and then I would turn it on and off using the enable pin. And normally I would just turn it on for a frame, turn it off for a frame, whatever. And I was like, I wonder if the laser is going to be fast enough if I just drive that with my UART output. Um, and sure enough, it was. So we can actually send data from like pretty far away. So Alvaro is going to hold, uh, hold the module this time. What I have here is, uh, other one, that's the USB port. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're still learning. Um, so. What I have here is a, a little Arduino. Um, yeah, we'll start here and see how far you can go. Uh, it's an Arduino module with my little diode on top. And um, this laser diode actually is pretty messed up because I was using it as a prototype and it's all kind of jacked up. So you can see like if you lift it up a little bit onto the wall, see how it's already like diffused and it's like this weird line. Uh, I was just, I didn't want to take the thing off because it's epoxied on and everything. So this is a prototype that Sophie gets. Um, so we'll see if we can like hold this on and I think I don't remember what baud rate this was being sent at either. So it would be a mystery. Um, do you remember what it was? Well, we'll see. Okay, so let's see if we can... I'm going to hold this low so I don't get shine in the face. So we see something... Yeah, okay. Ah. <laughs> yeah, cool. So this I had to actually... It's at 19200, but I had to flip the polarity from inverted asynchronous serial to normal asynchronous serial. And it actually, it's interesting because we have to shine the laser like not directly in the center of the diode, but a little bit off. And it might be because it's just way too high power. Um, but yeah, so there, data over laser. Wow. Wow. <laughs> okay, almost done. All right, yeah, so limitations of this particular design. Um, like I talked about, the data has to be NRZ encoded if we want to actually use a terminal program and the, the USB to serial adapter to receive it. Um, that's okay because you can use the test point earlier. I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, receive range is, you know, somewhat limited unless you're using a laser or you have good optics to do stuff. Um, but again, for my purposes of like just doing kind of general exploration of devices that might be transmitting or doing little demonstrations, like that's fine. Uh, and another thing is that it's hard to see what the potentiometer settings are. The potentiometers we're using, they're surface mount, um, they're multi-turn pots, and they don't have stops at the end. So if you go left, 
it's a 12 turn pot, but if you go left more than 12 turns, it just keeps going, but the, the value doesn't change, it's just at the end. Um, so you, it's hard to visually see like what are your gain settings for a particular uh, target. Maybe in the future somebody could figure out a way to do positioning and maybe a digital pot, you could use digital pots to do something, I don't know. Questions for the future. Uh, and yeah, so ideas of things, if you're like, oh, what do I even do with this? Um, you can look for off-the-shelf products and see if they've been compromised or see if they're unintentionally leaking information like that original paper. I guarantee you there are still things that do this because if you think from an engineering perspective of if I want to have a status LED, what's the easiest way? You use the same line that you are for the data and just hook it up to the LED. Saves a pin. Uh, so, you know, look for stuff like that. Maybe we want to find optical networking, communication systems. Maybe you want to just transfer data or exfiltrate data from a product, from a robot, from whatever. Uh, very easy way to do it. Or maybe you just want to walk around and like take measurements of, of light and like how light is this room and maybe look at the data and try to take a guess at that. So um, just use it as like another sensor in your toolbox of things. And yes, come into the light. Uh, if you are interested in building your own, everything is available on my website. That's the whole link. Yeah, grandideastudio.com, portfolio, optics buy. Um, everything's up there. All the demo code for the different demos are up there as well. Um, I am making, I did just make a little Oshpark module for the laser diode. Uh, so I'm waiting for those to come back before I post all that information, but that will be online. Uh, and I'm doing a few other experiments as well that eventually I'll post up there. Bare boards are from Oshpark. And uh, if you want assembled units, Crowd Supply has uh, a few left. I don't know how many, but, but a, a handful. And I never mentioned that this original version of the project, if you look on the back or if you see pictures of it, it says Crowd Supply Edition. Um, Josh Lifton from Crowd Supply, who runs Crowd Supply, was putting together a conference and said, hey, we should use this, this optical receiver as like some cool workshop and, and people can explore with LEDs and stuff. So he was really the kind of motivation to turn it into more of an easy to use product. Um, and then because he runs Crowd Supply, he convinced me to do this little campaign. So we made a bunch and we have some, in case you don't want to build your own, uh, though they're pretty easy to build if you like working with surface mount stuff. So that is it. Thank you for watching. <laughs>